is Douglas Murray. He's the director of the Centre for Social Cohesion here in Britain, which tries to promote integration between Britain's ethnic minorities and the wider population, and it specialises in radicalisation. So, Douglas Murray, your time starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Tariq says that Europeans associate Islam with violence. There is some truth in that. There is also a very obvious reason for that, which is that Islam is associated with violence. It was not Buddhists who flew planes into the Twin Towers. It was not Hindus or Jews that blew up the London Underground buses a few years ago. And that simple fact has to be acknowledged if you're even going to start a dialogue. Now, the, what is happening... Ladies and gentlemen, it's not a pantomime. I'd uh, argue that Europe has done not too badly, considering the circumstances. In the middle of the last century, there was, or there was an almost negligible Muslim presence in Europe. At the turn of the 21st, in Western Europe alone, there were 15 to 17 million Muslims. That's a very fast migration, ladies and gentlemen, one of the fastest in human history. And no society would find it easy to deal with that kind of migration. As it happens, uh, European societies, Western European societies, have, I think, dealt with this much better than some would. Certainly, Muslims coming to live in Britain and in Western Europe enjoy more rights and better rights, among them freedom of worship, than they do in any Islamic country in the earth here today. We do have a problem. We have a problem when the failures of Islam throughout the world, the failures of all Islamic societies, come here into Britain. Their intolerance of freedom of conscience their intolerance of apostates, their intolerance of freedom of expression and freedom uh, of speech, their intolerance of minorities, other religious minorities, sexual minorities, their intolerance of gays, their dislike and distrust of half of the population, women, and many, many other things. And the call, what's more, and the call, what's more, for a parallel legal system within Britain and European societies. This is monstrous. No other group behaves like this, asks for parallel laws. This is a fundamental problem, and it's one we're going to have to deal with. It's a problem between a society, Western Europe, that believes that laws are based on reason, and Islam that believes that they are based on revelation. Between these two ideas, I'm not sure there is very much compromise for Europe. It is not Europe that has let down its Muslims but the Muslims of Europe that have let down Europe. This is not solely something which we have to say we can never reconcile. Of course we can reconcile this, but we need to be honest about it. We need to be frank about it, and we cannot avoid things just because they are unpleasant. And if there were one thing I would wish Muslims in Europe could learn today, as fast as possible, it would be this, that you have no right in this society not to be offended. You have no right to say that because you don't like something, you can commit violence or you would like something to be stopped or censored. You have no right to have more hate laws or hate crime laws or hate speech laws just to defend Islam. You have to realize, the Muslims of Europe have to realize, that a society in which even your deepest feelings can be trodden upon is the only society worth living in. And the sooner we can learn that, the sooner that Islam can learn that within Europe, the better. It is not Europe that has failed its Muslims. It is Islam that has failed Europe. I'd argue Islam has failed its Muslims. Thank you. Um, I just had a question to Mr. Well, a few questions to Mr. Murray. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think it's the Muslims of Europe that have failed, Mus uh, that failed, sorry, the Muslims of Europe that have failed Europe. I think it's ex that exactly the opposite. Um, one of the things you said it was, um, yeah, it was actually a few Muslims, crazy Muslims, I think, who sort of flew the plane into those buildings. But was Hitler a Muslim by any chance? Because I'm not sure that Muslims had anything to do with the Holocaust. Okay. Gentlemen there. In 2009, the Centre for Muslim Studies, along with the Gallup poll, uh, interviewed 500 British Muslims. Over 99.5% of those British Muslims found homosexual acts unacceptable. What was interesting is that the government has given concession to Muslims as well as other religious organizations. So it seems to me, in fact, this government here is prepared to give religious organizations, including Muslims, the rights over lots of gay men and women. Okay. Gentlemen up there. 
you talked about how Europe has dealt with this problem. And what you basically have alluded to in the six minutes that you had are that Muslims are a problem. And you're from the organization called the Center for Social Cohesion. And it's worrying that to have you talk about these things in this manner. What you are basically alluding to is that Muslims are external to Europe and it's worrying that you see it that way because then that means there is no chance of there being any solution to any problem or Muslims being seen as a part of Europe and being seen as European okay. citizens. Thank Thanks. you. Gentlemen, I just want to pick up uh, something that Doug Murray said. I'd like to ask you, when you talk about the Muslims that are the problem, which Muslims are you talking about? Because you keep slipping in your language to focus on the radicals, the extremists. Okay, right. Maybe that's because that's what you're interested in. But there's another whole set of Muslims out there who are not like that. Okay, just a quick clutch there. Um, yeah. It is sufficient to point out that Europe is not failing its Muslims, that this debate is taking place tonight and is being televised by the BBC World Service, that Tarek Ramadan holds a chair at Oxford University. I put it to you because of these very facts that you are being welcomed, that you are being integrated, that you are being respected. You are not a problem. Okay, let's just take... All right, so let's hear some brief comments, please, and questions from our audience. OK, the lady there. Thank you. I have one question for the opposition, although most in this hall would agree that the uh, human rights that are um, accorded to all of our citizens, Muslim and non-Muslim, are greater than those in the Arab nations. Do you think that we have failed Muslims by allowing the language of Islam as against us to propagate on and on since... <clears throat> excuse me, particularly since 9-11, but even before that, and therefore allow our own Muslims within our own countries to feel as, they, as if they are part of the enemy rather than part of our own countries. Okay. Okay, I, I want to take very quick ones then. Okay, this lady here. Uh, I just want to make a quick uh, comment to the throwaway comments made by uh, Douglas Murray uh, about uh, Muslim women and Islam uh, uh, and its way it treats women. And I think that uh, Muslim women are quite capable of speaking for themselves. And I think the sort of <laughs> myths people like you put in the public arena, and I've heard other similar arguments from BNP and all that kind of stuff, they think it justifies their argument by saying, well, Islam treats 50% of its population in a really derogatory and whatever, whatever way that you like to explain okay. it. Okay. Um, oh, you've got a mic. No, that gentleman there, is it? Yeah. Surely it's Islamic countries and nations and religion who are letting down many Muslims. The lack of correct investment in education, social justice and welfare in their own countries, which has caused so much social migration to Europe, which wouldn't have happened. But surely the, this lack of contribution to education and ability, especially of women, of freedom, has stopped this um, growing and contributing to Europe as much as they could. Let's just take this young lady here with, with the headscarf and then we'll come to our panel. Um, I'm a British female. I love this country and I give this country. Now you're calling me a problem. I don't think I am. I think you are. Um, second point is, um, as a Muslim female, okay, my parents might not let me go somewhere late at night because people are racist to me. They tell me to go back home and they hurt me. I got hit by two white guys and they laughed at me because I'm a scarfie, okay? Um, Last point is to Mr. Fleming, um, about the point where you said um, about the religion, changing religion, every person has a right to, no one says anything about that, but if you had a daughter or um, a son that wanted to become a Muslim, would you be happy about that? I don't think so. <laughs> Douglas Murray, what would you say to that lady? Uh, uh, no, of course it wouldn't bother me. I mean, I would hope that if somebody has access, th th look, uh, what Fleming and I are arguing for is that People have the right to access all of the kind of opinions, all of the knowledge that they can. That means, among other things, having, for instance, access to all of the criticism that should be written of the Quran and of Islam. And if they weigh up after knowing all of these things and having access to all of them that they would like to become Muslim, I don't have a problem with that. All right. I want to get some response to what we heard out, some of the comments our audience made. I'd just like to make uh, a comment on one of the cases that, uh, that uh, Petra made, uh, which was about uh, Ahmed uh, Abu Talib, a very distinguished uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, public 
figure in Holland. What you failed to mention when you mentioned him as a, as a great success story of the Netherlands, which I agree he is, is that after the murder of Ter van Gogh in 2004, uh, he had to go under 24-hour protection because his name was found on a hit list for a radical cell nearby. We cannot simply take, Petra, the terrific success stories and ignore things like that. It is no small thing that a Muslim politician who speaks out should be targeted for assassination in his home country of the Netherlands. And many and Muslims we... and Muslims... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, Tariq Ramadan, yes. we get the point. Yeah, well, Ramadan. Once again, I think that uh, you are taking one story and then it was building, the one she took. No, it is, and many Muslims around the world and in the Netherlands were against that and yes. attacked the small groups that were saying this. And this is the case today in Europe. This, the discourse that you have, is helping to nurture this sense of alienation and to not to let the Muslims feel that they are at home. And out of the questions that we got from here, people are saying, you are welcome here and then in their own country. I'm sorry, I'm at home. Mm. I'm at home. No, what are you that. talking about? Don't talk about it. So, talk to me. I'm sorry. To talk to us or talk to me as a fellow European and not as someone who is an outsider infiltrating the freedom of expression and using this. This is one. Can Let I, me finish. Can I come back to no. no, I'm not saying you're not a European, but I would appreciate the following, yeah. which is that don't come to this hall and tell this hall that you're European, that you're a European, and go to another and talk to an Islamic audience as Islamic brothers, because that is what you have spent your career oh, doing. Speaking. Speaking through. Let me finish this. 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 Tariq comes here one day and says, oh, We fellow Europeans, we all speak to each other as fellow Europeans. And another, he speaks from Muslim audience and says, We as Muslims. Which is it, Tariq? Which is it? I'm, I'm a Muslim. You can't pretend you have two identities. Come just you know, say, you know what? Can I say something about But you it? are, you are well, my. Okay, you two, just a minute. We, we get your point. Let Douglas, I want to ask you, you heard some of the people from the floor there, the woman complaining about attacks on her because she's described as a scarfie because she wears a head veil. I mean, that is something that you would regret. I mean, that doesn't promote social course, cohesion. Nobody, nobody, nobody thinks that any physical attacks or any such thing could be, could be uh, uh, a good thing to happen. Of course not. Of course, there are. Let's not. But let's not. Let's make sure. Let's make sure we're talking right. about prejudice. Prejudice though. exists in society. Let's just be absolutely clear this is an awkward audience. Prejudice undoubtedly exists in this society. It exists across racial groups, including from minorities to other minorities, after all, which is one of the things we see increasingly in Britain these days. And it is also the case that people, in particularly famously lower socioeconomic groups, are likely to feel hatred for other groups. That is one of the things that has to be tackled, and everyone, I think, in this hall, I'm sure, we're in agreement that that should be tackled. But do not mix up somebody, a thug, a racist, and so on attacking somebody in a street with the right of Fleming and me to say what we see in the Quran, what we think of Muhammad, and maybe even asserting our right to say so. Okay, all right, now. Um, my name's Henry Hogger. I'm a former British diplomat in the Arab world. I worked until uh, fairly recently for something called the Muslim West Facts Project, which uh, is an exercise to publicize the findings of a, a, some Gallup polling on Muslim opinion in Europe. One of the most striking features in that, I think, is that um, in Britain, France, and Germany, that uh, Muslims, when asked for their, uh, f how strongly they feel attached to the country that they live in, on the whole, gave stronger answers of loyalty than did the public as a whole, a sample of the public as a whole in those three countries. It seems to me that that's a strong and positive reason for arguing against the motion that uh, uh, Europe is failing its Muslims, but not the, the reasons which I fear our uh, speakers against the motion have been giving, which rather inclined to blame Islam and Muslims themselves for the problem. Okay, thank you. Please. The gentleman behind you. I'll come to you in a second. I do a lot of work with uh, Christians who've come out from the Middle East, sometimes due to uh, persecution and British policy is frequently behind that, so the world is very complicated. But what worries me is that a lot of the things that people are worried about, about, about Muslim immigrants into Europe um, are very hard attitudes that a lot of the Christians also have. And I think if you are, for instance, from a gay minority in, um, in a lot of those communities, it is very, very worrying. And therefore we need to be thinking um, slightly bigger 
than just this Muslim thing, but it is about a, a wider cultural problem. Right, okay. The lady now wearing the hat. Just a comment to you, what you said about women. I think, first of all, that's really misleading because you're getting culture confused with religion. And if you just take a moment to look into the Quran, you'll see the Quran gave women rights long before women in Europe started burning brass for their own rights. And you'll also see that actually in the Quran, it encourages women to seek education. It protects us from violence and it actually gives us rights in marriage. Right, okay. So you're very wrong. We, um, can I go upstairs? Yeah. I'm Oliver Cam. I'm a leader writer for The Times. Uh, immediately after the Swiss vote to ban construction of minarets, my newspaper published a leading article condemning the vote as inflammatory and a violation of religious liberty. But beyond religious liberty, beyond your sir, right to freedom of association and worship, I cannot understand what possible claim your deeply held religious beliefs have on the rest of society. They are, in my judgment, flawed and incoherent and wrong. Why do I have any reason to respect them, and why do they belong in civic society? Okay. Just some brief ones now. Yeah. I was uh, brought up a Catholic uh, in Ireland. Later on in life, I moved to England and I converted to Islam. Did my testimony of faith, and I was ostracized by a lot of my friends. As a practicing Muslim, it was 2003. A few years later, I came out as gay, and I was ostracized by a lot of my Muslim peers. And, I, and then I became very isolated, and I was lonely. I didn't know where I was. And I think the question today really is: It isn't is Europe, uh, you know, is a feeling it's Muslims, but are we all feeling one another? And that's something that we should really look at. And I'm now in love with a lovely Muslim man and a good relationship. So thanks very much. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm just a human being. I don't represent any sort of party or community or anything like that. I respect all religions. And as far as I'm concerned, they've always shown respect for me. And I don't think that it's fair that we should judge an entire religion by a few fringe people. Because if you count the Muslim community, it's humongous. You know, you can't just say, right, right terrorism, that's it. That's it. Douglas Murray, director of the Centre for Social Cohesion, a think tank which studies radicalisation and extremism in Britain. Um, your closing statement. Thank you. Well, first of all, just to um, pick up on a couple of people, particularly women, who've said about the terrific things that Islam gives women in terms of rights. The first thing is, yes, in 7th century Arabia, some of this was progressive. In 21st century Britain, it is not. And you have to make that fundamental admission that the Quran is not a document for women's rights in Europe in 2010. It is not. Secondly, secondly, why is it that only Islamic societies and mosques in this country are places which teach and preach hatred of other minorities? Every single week in this country, every single week in this country, every single week in this country, there are people on campuses who teach the murder of minorities. Last week, it was, a, it was somebody who calls for the murder of apostates. The week before, at another university, it was somebody who believes the Jews are fair game. This is not tolerable. It is not tolerable for Muslims. It is not tolerable from anyone else. You, I hope, would agree with me that any minority that engaged in such hatred and bigotry should be criticised. Don't pretend that the cloak of Islam and Islamic belief and religious fervor means that people like us cannot say that people who call for the murder of minorities are not mainstream, okay. are not acceptable, and have to be critiqued. Right. Well, <laughs> Against the motion, 346. 346. And the joke. The don't knows have gone from 218 to 84. So Europe is failing its Muslims against have won Douglas Murray and Fleming Rose. Congratulations to you.